children on my street used to go missing. I found them in the walls of my house. The head in the wall was crusted and decayed, mummified in its plastic shroud, the withered face open-mouthed in a scream, or maybe the jaw had loosened as the muscles decayed. The plastic is what held in the smell, though I do vaguely remember sometimes an odor permeating, especially during steamy summers. I was always told the smell was garbage. Alongside the head, other parts set similarly stored in plastic bins. When I finally saw the corpse from the wall reassembled, it was hard to believe that anyone would do this to another human being. Harder still to imagine it was my own father who committed such horrific acts. Before I continue, a warning. If you are triggered by graphic descriptions of child abuse or death, do not read further. Mine is a harrowing account. I grew up in a house surrounded by bodies. The bodies of childhood playmates and acquaintances. When asked why he'd done it, my father always gave the same answer. As I recount the story now, I picture him in that interview room, how he must have looked facing the police. Victor Chen was a small, nervous, almost delicate man. He must have been petrified, his eyes swollen shut and his lip bleeding, his hands rubbing and rubbing, nails digging deep into the flesh of his wrists and palms as they peppered him with the same questions over and over. Why? Why children? Why in the walls? Why? I had to. Tears running down his cheeks, this was all he would say. I had to. Why little kids, you sick fuck? I imagine the officer's sneer. Imagine how my father cowered as the man struck him. We know what you did to them. Why you wanted them. No. I never did anything to them. I just killed them. You just killed them. Yes. You expect me to believe. I had to. Piece of shit. If the interrogation went anything like my father said, that officer beat him within an inch of his life. Only after he was on the floor, groaning and at the brink of unconsciousness, did the second officer intervene, pulling back the violent one. They hustled my father back into his chair. The calmer officer spoke in measured tones. Now, Mr. Chen, tell me what happened to Mary Lewis, Kaylee Jensen, Kyle Sanderson, Terry Choi, Evie Connor. You obviously put a lot of thought into everything. Packing them into the walls takes a lot of materials and preparation. You must have had a reason for choosing them. What was it? But he would not say. When I confronted him, it did not go much better at first. He wouldn't speak for ages, just sat there with his head down and tears dripping from his eyes. Finally, his gaze lifted. I suppose you think I'm a monster, he whispered. Are you? I asked. He burst into sobs. Through his hands, his muffled, repeated line, I had to. My father's crimes were not motivated by any of the reasons commonly ascribed to serial killers. They were not sexual in nature, and while most of the victims were minors, they ranged in age from 8 to 18, and he also murdered his own brother. Regardless of who they were, all bodies received the same treatment. Dismemberment plastic wrap, concealment in the walls. Some were childhood friends of mine, though none of them close. He chose carefully, it seems, meticulous with his murders as with his blueprints. He was an architect, a trade that served him well. And yet growing up, I never had the slightest inkling of what lay within our walls. Indeed, I could not have imagined it. My father was shy and soft-spoken in public, warm, and kind in private. What I remember most about him is his laughter, the way his eyes would crinkle. He was devoted to the memory of my mother, who passed away when I was so little I could not remember her. In later years I often saw him with dark circles under his eyes, and his smile became rare. Our relationship was strained by my teenage rebelliousness, but one thing I was certain of growing up, he loved me more than anything or anyone in the world. Yet when I look back now, I can see that there were always hints of his darker tendencies. For example, when I was seven years old, he taught me to butcher a pig. Now to my mind, this is not something to expose to a small child. But there we were, a pig splayed out on the basement table, its eyes glassy and mouth gaping, 
blood dripping from its severed head onto his shoes. He explained that rather than buy meat in expensive packaging, we could save money by butchering and freezing the meat ourselves. Of course I shrieked hysterically. He clicked his tongue, chopping off its trotters and dropping them in a bucket as he reminded me how I loved bacon and pretending the bacon just magically appeared in an aisle in the grocery store was a kind of dangerous magical thinking that allowed all sorts of atrocities. You can do anything evil, he declared, if you sanitize it in plastic. A chilling statement in retrospect. Then there was the time my uncle came to work for us. My father did not like Uncle Rudy. I have a better understanding of why now, but at the time, all I knew was that Uncle Rudy was perpetually borrowing money. At the urging of my grandparents, my father, who was never rich but made enough to live comfortably, hired Uncle Rudy to do some work on the exterior of the house. There were strict parameters my uncle had to follow. Some of these were sensible, such as not to consume alcohol, but other precautions struck me as especially harsh. For example, my uncle was only briefly allowed to come inside for bathroom breaks, and at all other times, even for lunch or water breaks, he had to remain outside in the sweltering sun. But as was often the case in those days, my father was not always present to enforce these rules. One day when I got into trouble at school, my father could not be reached. It was Uncle Rudy who picked up the phone and agreed to come and get me. At home, he gave me a Coke. My father only let me have soda occasionally, claiming it was bad for my teeth, and told me the girls who bullied me were a bunch of shitheads. I giggled, reveling in his rebellious language and feeling immediate kinship with him. Thereafter, while my father was away at work, I would invite Uncle Rudy to sneak inside to watch TV with me. He was always smiling and chummy, and when he started drinking beer while I had soda, it was our little secret. We were both breaking my father's rules. Then one day, as we sat watching TV on the sofa, he squeezed me and told me what a special little girl I was. Didn't I know how special? His breath stank of beer and his sweaty, hairy arm draped over me. I didn't like his face so close but didn't know what to do or say, and he kept rubbing my back, his hand sliding under my cotton shirt, his fingers hot on my skin. He leaned his head close to mine, his lips against my ear, speaking softly like he was trying to make me feel better. Only he made my inside squirm. That was when my father came home. Uncle Rudy withdrew immediately as the door opened, but my father must have suspected something because his eyes narrowed to slits. He sent Uncle Rudy outside to finish working, and right away sat me down to ask me what happened. Oh, he was just asking me about school. For some reason, I felt compelled to protect my uncle. My father's eyes honed in on the beer. Was he drinking? Only a little. Sadie, love, I promise you are not in any trouble. No, no, no trouble, you hear. But it's very important that you tell me the truth. Did he? Was he sitting very close to you? Touching you? I couldn't meet my father's keen eyes. I nodded, biting my lip feeling like I'd betrayed Uncle Rudy. But also, I hadn't liked his closeness, his beer stinking breath. My father was always clean and smelling of cologne or aftershave, and not sweaty and breathy like Uncle Rudy. I explained, he was rubbing my back. Like this? My father rubbed my back. Under my shirt, I admitted. He went pale. But just as quickly, his expression smoothed over. Well, sweetheart, We'll talk a little more later. Hum. Thank you for telling me. You're a very bright girl. And the girls at school who've been bullying you are all stupid heads. I giggled. They are. Big dumb stupid heads. The biggest and the dumbest. My father poked me, which made me squeal, and then told me to go on up to my room. Read some books, and we'd go get ice cream later. I just need to have a quick word with Uncle Rudy about the yard. All right. Go on then. I went upstairs, smiling, but I knew he was putting me on, and so I snuck back downstairs to eavesdrop. As I neared the office door, I caught my uncle's booming protestation. Why? Jesus fucking Christ. I was comforting her, 
that's all. What the fuck do you think I was doing? Fuck, bro. The screech of a chair against the floor. Through the gap in the door, I could just see my father lunge, gripping my uncle by the shirt. My father was, as I've mentioned, a slight man, especially compared to my bullish uncle. And yet whatever it was my father hissed into his face, it made my uncle go pale with fear, recoiling as if my father were a spitting cobra. Fucking crazy. Burst Uncle Rudy, breaking his grip and storming out. Both of them saw me, but Uncle Rudy just flared his nostrils and bouldered past. I stood awkwardly in the hall, trembling. The feral rage vanished from my father's face, and he rushed over. Oh, Sadie, I'm so sorry. I should have known better. Your grandparents, they begged me to help him. I thought if I had rules. I'm so sorry, my darling. I didn't really understand at the time why he was so distraught. My uncle had done nothing but rub my back and tickle my ear with his whiskers and disgusting beer breath. I didn't know about the other things my uncle had done that my grandparents had hushed up, protecting their eldest son. And even though I'd come out of the encounter unscathed, I think my father still felt the deepest regrets. Things became very strained between him and my grandparents after that. He stopped taking me to visit them. We were isolated, a family of two. Another reason, perhaps, that no one suspected what he hid in those walls for such a long time. There was no one in our lives except us. If it's hard for you to reconcile this paternal figure with the bodies dismembered and wrapped in plastic, well, imagine how hard it was for me when I finally figured out what he'd been up to all these years. The first disappearance happened when I was in second grade. I had a sleepover just before my eighth birthday, celebrating early because my birthday fell on a school night, and my father was very strict about the importance of school. Four friends came over, and we were slicing the cake when a little girl knocked on my door. Her name was Mary, and she lived up the street. During summers when school was out and my friends were on vacation, there weren't many other kids on our block. So Mary and I were sort of stuck with each other as playmates. But once school started up again, I usually shun her in favor of school friends until the next summer. She knocked on my door to invite me over, but seeing I was having a sleepover, she got very excited. I didn't want her joining us and gave her some white lie about how we didn't have enough cake. I am not sure how, just shy of eight years old, I already had a facility for white lies, or what this says about the example my father set. Mary's face reddened at my rejection, and she was about to sulk away when my father told her of course she could join the party. When she refused, he offered to at least get her a party gift bag. Mary looked at the toys my school friends had gotten in their gift bags and temptation won over pride. She waited while he prepped the bag. He gave me a look, the look he'd give when I hadn't done my chores or did poorly on a test or otherwise disappointed him. Then he brought the gift bag out to Mary. Certain he'd reprimand me later, I stuffed myself with cake, as if, by eating as much as possible, I was somehow proving my right to have everything my way. Later, my friends and I were in my room in a sea of beds laid out on the floor, with a tent for me, and fairy lights strung up all around. I was feeling in good spirits by then. So when my father came in to wish us good night, I asked him if Mary liked her gift bag. Rather than the reproach I was expecting, he actually flinched, mumbled good night, and served us all bedtime hot cocoa. I didn't finish mine because I'd had so much cake. In retrospect, this is probably the reason I woke up. It was the scream that jolted me awake. I shot up, gasping, eyes wide, goosebumps prickling my arms. Vaguely, I wondered if I'd only been having a nightmare. Pushing the covers off, I set my feet on the floor. My friends were all sound asleep. Light shone under the bedroom door. Careful not to step on any of my cocooned friends, I tiptoed to the door and peeked out into the brightly lit hallway. Dad. Silence. I padded down the staircase. In the shadowed living room, remnants from our party lay scattered around the sofa. That was unusual. My father was very tidy and never left a mess overnight. Light poured from the kitchen door and I went in, 
observing the mound of dishes stacked by the sink, cake crumbs, and frosting crusting the plates. At the far end of the kitchen, the basement door was ajar. And from below, rustling, the crackle of plastic, the chest freezer opening and closing, then the tread of footsteps on the stairs. I stood frozen, a deer in the headlights as the door hinges creaked and my father emerged. He was dressed in what looked like baggy, throwaway clothes from Goodwill, with an apron tied around his waist, an apron soaked in red, and his face bore an expression I'd never seen before, a peculiar, manic gleam in his eye. Dad? He stopped in his tracks, voice hoarse. Sadie. I just looked at his bloody apron. He quickly removed it and bunched it into the sink. Sadie, what are you doing awake? It's three in the morning. Is that blood? His eyelids fluttered. Then he said, go sit at the table. I sat. I heard the kitchen faucet turn on and the sounds of scrubbing. The flicker of the stove. A few moments later, my father came in with a cup of hot cocoa, which he insisted I drink. I became drowsy even before I finished it and all but collapsed in my chair, only vaguely aware as he lifted me and carried me upstairs. I remember feeling sick, partly from the drink, but mostly from the smell. He smelled so strongly of blood. In the morning, I woke to an empty bedroom. My father told me my friends were all at school, but he hadn't wanted to disturb me. I was feeling groggy and unwell, so I believed him when he said I had a fever. By afternoon, I was better and the next day went to school as normal. You might wonder why I never suspected anything, but when I saw all my friends the next day, they all teased me for being gluttonous and eating too much cake, and they exclaimed about the fairy lights and gift bags. That was all. Everything seemed normal. Besides, it was not long after that incident, the very day after the party, in fact, that my father showed me how to butcher a pig. And so the image of my father in a bloody apron became firmly associated with pork in our chest freezer. If I had any recollection of screams in the middle of the night, well, I assumed it was a pig. A few days later, my father did some renovations, tearing open the space under the stairs and patching it up over some leaky pipes. When a garbage smell permeated the walls, he told me it was sewage, that it was the pipe problem, but that it would go away soon. It did. And when I finally wondered again about Mary, after she didn't turn up to play for weeks, well, the story of the girl who went missing on our street seemed a tragic cautionary tale. Sad, but unrelated to our house. My father acted very sorry when he found out. He sent flowers to the family, and always referred to her as that poor, sweet girl, and wouldn't let me wander our neighborhood alone because of what happened. Is it any wonder I was completely taken in? I had no idea, until the day her mummified corpse was discovered in our house and the decade-old missing persons case finally solved. But why did my father butcher my playmate, dismember her, and wrap her in plastic to putrefy behind the floral wallpaper? There are many theories. Some claim my father had dissociative identity disorder, a classic split personality. The meek, sensitive father who was a good man, and his evil twin, killing as a means of asserting control, breaking all the taboos that held meek Victor in submission, a domineering hide to his cowering Jekyll. Or another theory, Victor Chen suffered some form of psychosis and was given to visual and auditory hallucinations. He heard voices dictating what he should do, and believed that if he did not obey, terrible things would happen to his family. And so he succumbed to these violent delusions, though they were merely products of a damaged brain. Or the most popular theory, that he was just evil. That his mild-mannered persona was a front, beneath which lurked a scheming Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer. This theory, by far the most popular, is the one that makes the least sense to me, because you would not think such a predator would make an exception for his own daughter. Typically abusers target those closest to them, and yet, I never saw this side of him that people claim was his true self. Only the occasional, mysterious glimmer of desperation, and the sense, 
especially throughout my teenage years, that some sort of shadow was devouring him from the inside. The next two disappearances happened in my tweens. The first was a girl from school who was supposed to come over for a project. She never showed. Police interviewed me and my father several times, but since I truthfully reported that I never saw her, I think the suspicion that might otherwise have settled on my father was deflected. The second was the first and only boy among his victims. Kyle Sanderson had been blowing spitballs and pulling my hair on the bus to school. When I complained about it to my father, he questioned me intently. The boy's name, where he lived, where he was picked up by the bus. He said he would call the school. A few days later, Kyle was not on the bus. I assumed my father had somehow made arrangements to rearrange our bus pickups, but when I asked, my father admitted he'd been too busy and hadn't contacted the district. He promised he would soon. But of course, Kyle never returned to the bus. We children were once again put under strict watch and ordered never to walk alone in the streets. Mary Lewis, Kaylee Jensen, and now Kyle Sanderson. Somewhere in our quiet burb lived a predator. Each time a disappearance happened, that garbage smell would return. Just a faint whiff that wouldn't let up. And my father would forbid me having friends over, making excuses that the pipes were bad or an animal had died in the attic. Soon enough it would fade. It wasn't until the most recent time, when my father was finally caught, that I saw his true, monstrous nature, because I was the one who caught him. I was 17 and excited for a weekend trip with my best friend Mickey. We were planning to go swimming and have a bonfire party at Mickey's cousin's house. My overprotective father had never once allowed me to stay out past an 11 p.m. curfew, so to go unchaperoned through the whole weekend felt like the most liberating thing in the world. Frankly, it was odd he'd agreed to it, but I figured all my rebellious sniping had finally worn him down. His manner was almost mechanical when he warned me against the use of alcohol and reminded me to text him when I arrived. As he was walking me to Mickey's car, he also warned me to be careful about boys of the party. Plenty of friends, he said, had dark secrets and couldn't be trusted, especially after a few drinks. Rolling my eyes and promising for the umpteenth time that I'd be safe, I left. But during the long drive, Mickey and I got into a heated argument. I don't remember what it was about now, just that I called her silly and shallow, and she called me selfish and melodramatic. Before I knew it, I was on my way home, in a taxi, since I couldn't bear the shame of both bailing on the trip and having to be collected like an immature baby by my father. I cried all the way back, so I suppose is yes, I was being pretty melodramatic. It was well after midnight by the time I finally entered the house and I was greeted with the sound of banging. Thud, thud, thud. I stopped in the door, mouth agape. My father hadn't told me of any renovation plans, but the lights were on upstairs, the banging sounds coming from my bedroom. Dad, I called. Immediately, the banging stopped, the rustle of plastic and hurried footsteps. My father came out, shutting the door to my bedroom just as I reached the top of the stairs. Sadie. He looked panicked. What are you doing here? Why are you in my room? All I wanted was to fling myself on my bed, scream into my pillow, and cry about my spoiled trip. The last thing I needed was my father to be in one of his house rearranging moods, especially not in my room. Renovations. You weren't supposed to be back until Monday. Mickey was being a bitch. I tried to push past him, but he blocked my way. No, there's asbestos. It's dangerous to breathe. You're not wearing a mask. Suddenly suspicious, I felt a flash of anger. Incensed, he'd violated my privacy by entering my room. And maybe, just maybe, the suspicion of some darker secret sparked in me. A spark of fear uncertainty, because why was my father lying about asbestos? What was he hiding in there? I grabbed the knob. No. His hands gripped my arms. Go back downstairs, take your bag, and leave. Ow, Dad. Leave. His grip was like talons, so tight it felt he might break the skin. T. 
Tears started into my eyes. His brusque manner, the wild gleam in his eye, all of it set my heart hammering. Panic gave me strength to break loose and shove him. He slammed, hard, against the wall. I grabbed the knob and rushed in. No, 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 don't. No, his warning dissolved into a wail, and I glimpsed him biting his fist to control sudden sobbing. I slammed the door and locked it behind me, terrified. I'd never seen him in such a state, and then I turned and saw what he was hiding. My eyes raked across my belongings, arranged in one corner of the room. These were all the items from my closet, I realized, carefully sorted and stacked, far neater than the slovenly pile I usually left. The closet door was open, and the framing of a false wall lay partially constructed at the very back, shortening the walk-in space by about a foot. Shoved into this area were plastic bins and plastic bags, but my father had not finished stuffing them all back there. One of the bags, tightly wrapped and swathed in layers of plastic, lay on the floor at my feet as if hastily dropped when he heard my call. I bent down to lift it, turning it in my hands, and then I gasped. The bag fell from my fingers. Hair. Was that? A head of black hair. There was another bag nearby, a simple plastic shopping bag from Hot Topic. It contained a rumpled girl's tee, torn jeans, a jacket, none of them mine. Another bin contained a pair of Doc Martens, well-worn. I looked down to the bag I dropped with the hair, pushed it with my toe. Through the thick plastic, I could just see wide eyes gaping out at me, the ghostly impression of a face. I screamed. I don't know how long I stood there, screaming, before my father's hands tried to pull me away. I broke free and ran. Out of the house, up the street. I should have pounded on a neighbor's door, should have screamed the whole quiet little cul-de-sac alert. But I didn't. Oh God, oh God, I sobbed over and over, trying to come up with a plan, trying to conceive some explanation other than the obvious, something that might account for the strange smells, the walls torn open and replaced, a hallway shortened here, a closet sealed there, the rotting garbage smell. Oh God, oh God, oh God. In the end, I went back, because as shocked and stupefied as I was, even then, with the proof right in front of me, I never believed I was in any danger. It didn't even occur to me he might hurt me. I walked right upstairs. The bedroom door was closed. From beyond, the wear of a drill. Rustling. Shuffling. More drilling. He must have heard my return, yet he continued his work. I sat down with my back against the door, picked up my phone from where I'd dropped it in our struggle, and dialed 911. Speaking very quietly, tears dribbling down my face, I related what I'd seen to the dispatcher. When the police arrived, my father promptly surrendered. I went to stay with my grandparents while the house became a crime scene. Ultimately, seven bodies were found in the walls. Most of them minors, though there were two adults, Hot Topic Girl, just turned 18, as well as my uncle Rudy. The fates of Mary Lewis, Kaylee Jensen, and Kyle Sanderson were at last known. While the community reeled, all eyes turned to me, wondering, how could I have lived in that house and not known? Had I been an accomplice, like father, like daughter? How could I have grown up, surrounded by the bodies of my playmates, wrinkling my nose at the smell of their corpses putrefying in the walls around me, and just not known. I cannot tell you anything beyond what I already have. I believe the lies my father told me. I have wrestled with myself. Every night since I found out, over my complacency, my childish faith, my sheer stupidity, as I repeat to myself the same question everyone else has asked, over and over and over. How could I have not known? But there's another question, the more important one, why? Why did he do it? My father wouldn't tell anything to investigators, to his own attorney, to the psychiatrists who evaluated him for trial. He neither confirmed nor denied his crimes. He wouldn't speak. He just sat in his cell and cried, and the only phrase he uttered, when pressed, was I had to. 
There was only one person he finally consented to speak to. And so I was summoned. After a briefing with police and prosecutors, after assuring them of my cooperation, and that I too wanted to know the truth, that I would do anything to try to understand, they arranged for me to visit with my father, the first time I saw him since his arrest. When I came into the small spare room for our interview, I was shocked at the sight of him. Filthy, battered, his face a bloodied mess, one eye swollen closed, and his arms raked with scratches that he seemed to have put there himself, dragging his nails through his skin. He was fidgeting when I entered, head down, unwilling to make eye contact. Finally, his head lifted, just a little. He blinked, slowly wiped the tears from his eyes, dropped his gaze again. I suppose you think I'm a monster, he whispered. Are you? I asked. He burst into sobs. But after they'd passed, and he composed himself, after he'd asked how I was doing, and whether I was going to finish school, and how my college applications were going, after I finally told him none of that, was why I was here, finally, finally. He told me why. 